If you will turn with me to Leviticus 17. This is a weekend that a third of the world is celebrating Easter. About a third of the world are Christian. And tomorrow they are going to celebrate Easter. They're going to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus. I say they because we celebrate the resurrection every day. We live by the resurrection. We live in the resurrection every morning. But tomorrow, they'll be, they'll be worshiping God and singing Arise and, and all that. They will be celebrating Easter. But there is a part of the, of the death, burial, and resurrection that you may not have considered. There is a, a place. There is a perfection. That death, burial, and resurrection was made so perfect was carried out in such perfection that when it is finished, you will be perfect. Jesus just did die to bring us salvation so that we could be born again and be in heaven. That resurrection, the work that Jesus did on the cross, the work that Jesus did when he was in hell, the work that Jesus did when he was resurrection, resurrected, made you perfect. Made you perfect. But just like God, we have to do it like Jesus did. The just shall live by faith. And we have to use our faith to get to the place that Jesus made for us. Yes. Yes. Uh, Romans 10 says, by that, by that sacrifice, by that sacrifice, I know I, I can hear the people, you cannot be perfect. Well, then you don't believe the Bible. Jesus, uh, Jesus in Hebrews 10 said, by one sacrifice, he has perfected, perfected, perfected forever. We have to go after that perfection. And there will be a day when we are finished that we will be just like Jesus. That's the reason he came. And I want to show you part of that, part of that work. If you will go with me to Leviticus 17, verse 11. This is the father speaking to Moses, and it's wonderful. The father talked to Moses. Moses used his ears, and at times even saw God. They talked face to face. And it says, for the life of the flesh is in the blood. Did you know that's where your life is? It says, for the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls. Amen. For your souls. For it is the blood that maketh an atonement for the souls. You know, even in the medical world today, we can have artificial hearts. We can have artificial legs. We can have artificial ears. We can have artificial anything. But you know what? You take the blood out of a person and they are dead. Amen. Your life is in your blood. If you will turn with me to Exodus 25. You mean God had it right? Exodus 25 verse 16. This is God speaking to Moses how to make the ark. And he makes a wonderful statement at the end of this. He says, the, God speaking to Moses, Thou shalt put into the ark the testimony which I shall give thee. And thou shalt make a mercy seat. Isn't that wonderful? A mercy seat. God told him make a mercy seat. Not a judgment seat, a mercy seat. Amen. That is your God. That is your Jehovah. He said, And thou shalt make a mercy seat of pure gold. Two cubits and a half shall the length thereof, and a cubit and a half the breadth thereof. And thou shalt make two cherubims of gold, a beaten work, thou shalt make them in the two ends of the mercy seat. And thou shalt then make one cherub on one end and the other cherub on the other end. Even of the mercy seat shall you make the cherubims on the two ends thereof. And the cherubims shall stretch forth their wings on high, covering the mercy seat with their wings. And their faces shall look one to another. Toward the mercy seat shall the faces of the cherubims be. And thou shalt put the mercy seat upon the ark. And in the ark, thou shalt put the testimony that I shall give thee. And here is that verse that I want to get to. And there, and there, between the cherubs, and there, I will meet with thee. I will meet you. I will meet you. The God that stretched out the heavens like a curtain. The God that created the world through Jesus. The God that parted the Red Sea. The God, the God that stopped the world from turning, the God that turned the world backwards 10 degrees, will meet you there. And I will commune with thee from the top of the mercy seat, from between the two cherubims which are on the ark of the testimony, of all which I give thee in commandment unto the children of Israel. Can you imagine Aaron, Moses, walking into the holiest of holies, and there communing 
communing with the God of heaven, with the God that cannot be approached unto, with the God that created the world, which the God created you. Now, turn with me to Leviticus verse, uh, chapter 4. We are going to see what Moses did and how our sins back then under the law were forgiven. It says, and if he bring a lamb for a sin offering, a sin offering, a man sins. Now, I want to tell you right here, you read the book of Leviticus. If you committed one of the ten commandments, if you transgressed one of those ten, if you committed one of those sins, there was no atonement for you. All you got was dead. All you got was stoned. This is the other sins. All right. It says, and if he bring a lamb for a sin offering, he shall bring a female without blemish. And he shall lay his hand upon the head of the sin offering. Why? Because the sin that he committed is now going to be transferred to the lamb. The sin that the man committed transfers to the lamb, an innocent lamb. The sin that the man committed transfers to an innocent lamb. And it says, he shall lay his hand upon the head of the sin offering and then slay it for a sin offering in the place where they kill the burnt offering. You kill the lamb that was innocent that now has the sin of the man. And the priest shall take the blood of the sin offering with his finger and put it upon the horns of the altar of the burnt offering and shall pour out all the blood of that lamb that was innocent that now has the man's sin. He said, you pour out all the blood, therefore, at the bottom of the altar. And now shall take all the fat thereof as the fat of the lamb is taken away from the sacrifice of the priest offering. And the priest shall burn them upon the altar according to the offerings made by fire unto the Lord. And the priest shall make an atonement for his sin that he has committed, and it shall be forgiven him. Now, that was the Old Testament. I want you to go to John 19. Amen. We have something so much better. And this resurrection that most of the third of the world will celebrate tomorrow, I want you to understand that what we are going to look at was done for you. It was done for you. Yes, it was done for all humanity, but the resurrection was done for you. Was done for you. Not just your neighbor, not just the country down the street, not just humanity. The resurrection was done for you. For you. It is for you. It is for me. Everything that Jesus did on that cross was for you. And everything that Jesus did on that cross was for me. For me. And you know what? God knows every person. Uh, he, well, it says he knows all the sparrows. He knows you. He created you. You are where you're supposed to be. You are hearing the words you're supposed to hear. And you will find that that resurrection, what Jesus did with his blood, was for you. And God knows it's for you. And you can make it yours. Now, if you will go with me to John 19, verse 33. Jesus was on the cross. If you will read Isaiah 53, it says at one point, it says that the Father laid. The Father, God, who watched the crucifixion. The Father watched it. And then it came to a point where Jesus was on the cross. You know, I've said it before. Jesus walked to the cross. He walked. Some part, one of, the, uh, one of the verses in the Bible, one of the books says he carried his cross and then they gave it to another person, but Jesus walked. But once he was on that cross, it says in Isaiah 53 that the Father laid all our sin on Jesus. There came a point during the crucifixion that your sin, your sin, your sin, went on that body. My sin went on that body. And the wonderful thing about that, the most wonderful thing about that is the Father is the one that did it. The Father did it to Jesus. The Father took your sin that you committed and he put it on the body of Jesus. That was Jesus perfect. And Jesus took your sin into his soul as a man. As a man. A man's the one that messed it up in the beginning. A man had to fix it. And a man had to carry sin. God cannot carry sin. You cannot put sin on God. You can't kill a God. Jesus had to do it as a man. And he took your sin as a man. And the Father gave it to him, put it on him. And when Jesus was on that cross, he took your sin. And then when Jesus finished everything that he had to do on the cross, everything that the Father told him to do, the Father, after he laid 
the sin on Jesus turned his back on Jesus. The father could no longer look at his son. The father had to reject him. You say, how can that be? Jesus said, my God, my God, why? Why hast thou forsaken me? He couldn't look at his son any longer because his son had your sin on him. Your sin, your sin, not just your neighbor's sin, not just Africa, not just Asia, not just the United States, your sin. He took your sin on him and the father had to turn his back. Jesus made a wonderful statement. He said, it is finished. It's finished. After he saw he had to drink the vinegar, he drank the vinegar and then he said, it's finished. All the work he did for you, he had to do, get accomplished for you on the cross. He did. He did. And then he died. Now, I want you to look at verse 33 of John 19. It says, but when they came to Jesus and saw he was dead already, Jesus died before the other two. When he finished everything that he had to do, a body broken more than any man, marred more than any man, marred more than any man. Do you believe that Bible? Marred more than any. Every bone out of joint, uh, sunk down in the cross, no strength. When he had finished everything he needed to finish, that spirit, I love it, the spirit of Jesus kept him alive until he got everything accomplished. Kept that body alive, kept his brain working, kept his conscience there until he got everything done. And then he said, it's finished. And he gave up the ghost. They couldn't kill him. Folks, they couldn't kill him. Jesus gave up the ghost and he gave it up with your sin. He gave it up dying the world's worst sinner. He died the world's worst sinner. That's why he was marred more than any man. He had your sin. He had your sickness. He had your poverty. He had your peace on him. And he died. And it says, when they saw he was dead already, they broke not his legs. Jesus, it says, never, never a bone was broken. They were all dislocated. He said, but when one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side, then forthwith there came out blood and water. Just like in Leviticus, when God spoke to Moses, he said, when you kill, when you kill that innocent lamb with that man's sin, when you kill it, you are to take the blood, put it on the altar, and then you're to pour out the lamb's blood at the bottom of the altar. Folks, on that cross, the blood of Jesus was poured out. The blood of Jesus went to the ground. The blood of Jesus was poured out for you, for you. Now, the resurrection, chapter 20. I want you to read with me, verse 17. And Jesus said unto her, actually, we'll go up a little bit further. Let's go to verse uh, 14. And when Mary saw that was thus said, she turned herself back and she saw standing Jesus, and she knew not it was Jesus. And Jesus said unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? Whom seekest thou? And she, supposing him to be the gardener, said unto him, Sir, if thou had borne him thence, tell me where he, you have laid him, and I will take him away. And Jesus, Jesus, the man raised from the dead, and just like I said before, she thought he was the gardener, so he didn't sparkle. He wasn't transparent. He wasn't floating six inches across up over the ground. He looked like a man. She thought he was the gardener. He looked like a man, the man alive, the man that was dead and is now alive. She said, and he said, she turned herself and said unto him, Rabbani, which is master. Look what he says to her. He says, Mary, he said, touch me not. Don't touch me. Don't touch me. I have just walked out of the grave. Don't touch me. I got one more thing I got to do. He said, for I am not yet ascended to my father, but go to my brethren and say unto them, I ascend unto my father, my father, and your father, your father. I ascend unto my father. I ascend unto your father. Now he's our father. And he said, and to my God and your God. Where did he go? He had to ascend to the father before anybody could touch him. And you know he had to go someplace because when the next, uh, in the next thing you hear, Jesus tells Thomas, handle me, touch me. You see, I'm a man. I got blood. I've got bones. I mean, not blood. I've got bones and flesh just like you. He told Thomas, touch me. He said to them, handle me. But here he says, don't touch me yet. He had to go somewhere. Go with me to Hebrews 9. Oh, 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 if you will just consider this meeting. If you will just consider what Jesus does here. 
If you will just put this in your heart, then you won't be afraid of anything anymore. Not a thing anymore. All right. It says, Hebrews chapter 9, verse 11. But Christ, Jesus, being come, a high priest of good things to come, by a greater and more perfect tabernacle. Remember when God told Moses, this is how you're going to make the tabernacle, and you're going to make it just like I tell you here. Why? Because there's one in heaven. Moses was making a copy. He was making a replica of what was in heaven. It says a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, Jesus. By his own blood, Jesus. His own blood. It says, by his own blood, entered in once, once under the holy place, having attained eternal redemption for us. Jesus entered in to the holiest of holies in heaven. And I want you to go to verse 24. For Christ has not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are the figures of the true, but Jesus entered into heaven itself. And what did he do? He appeared in the presence of God for us. Can you imagine? I just can't. I cannot imagine the glory of this. Jesus, having finished the death, burial, and resurrection, having trusted the Father to raise him from the dead, Jesus walks out of the grave, and he's got one more thing he's got to do. He's got to go visit the Father in heaven. He said, I have not yet ascended up into my Father. And he goes into heaven, and he walks. He walks as a man into the holiest of holies. And he's got something with him. He's got his blood. He's got his blood. And just like the mercy seat, guess who meets him? Guess who meets him? Jesus is face to face with his father. Jesus is face to face with the God that had begotten him. Jesus is face to face with the man that raised, or the God that raised him from the dead. And Jesus is there finishing the job that God sent him to do. Can you imagine that glorious reunion? Can you imagine that glorious reunion? And can you imagine Jesus saying to the Father, here it is. Here it is. The very reason I went to earth was to sacrifice my blood and my body, and here it is. Here is the blood that I promised you. Here is the blood you sent me to bring, and here it is. And the whole world, the whole world in one moment is redeemed. Everything that we have ever done, everything the world has ever done, in one moment of time, has been redeemed and paid for. Amen. Paid for. And Jesus sprinkled the heavenlies with that blood. And you and I were redeemed. You and I were justified, just as if we have never sinned. You and I were sanctified, set apart to the Father for to do his works. Amen. You and I were redeemed, not only from our sin, but we were redeemed from the devil. We were redeemed from our behavior. We were redeemed from everything. And by that one sacrifice, by that one moment, we were made perfect. Amen. We were made perfect. Amen. Why do we not feel that way? Because we don't believe. Amen. Because we don't believe. Where the just shall live by faith. How did we get just? When Jesus walked into the holiest of holies and sprinkled his blood. Let's go back to verse 12. Neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered in to once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption. Eternal. You are now, because of that blood, eternally with the Father. How can you be afraid? How can you be afraid? It says, for if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer, sprinkling the unclean, sanctified to the purifying of the flesh, the outside, the outside, that's the flesh. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit, who through the eternal spirit, Jesus did this through the Holy Ghost. He could not just have been a man and hung himself on the cross. It would, have, it would not have worked. He had to do it through the Spirit. It had to be Amen. by God. Amen. And you will read in Acts, God had every step planned aforetime. Jesus knew exactly 
what was going to happen. He said, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God. Purge your conscience. Take it out of the middle of you. Take it out of your very depths of your heart. He can clean you where you will have no more remembrance of your sin. You know why? It won't be there. It won't be there. Redemption means it won't be there anymore. You will be perfect. It says, purge your conscience, your very conscience, the thing that keeps you awake at night. Oh, I wish I'd have never done that. Guess what? It can be removed. If you believe, it can all be removed. It says, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. And for this cause, he is the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. Your inheritance, your redemption goes into eternity. It goes into eternity, and it starts. Your eternity starts the day you believe that Jesus died and he was buried and he rose again. When you believe, your eternity with the Father begins. And the, the same spirit that took that body on through the cross, the same spirit in Jesus that held him together, that spirit will go into you when you are born again and you will begin your eternity today.